I want you to hit me as hard as you can. Pearl Harbor, a day that will live in infamy. Also, a Michael Bay movie. On the morning of December 7th, 1941, Japan launched a surprise attack against the U.S. military forces stationed in Hawaii, prompting the country to officially enter World War II. Sixty years later, the devastating strike would serve as the backdrop for director Michael Bay's film Pearl Harbor. The 2001 Jerry Bruckheimer production is not so much a war movie as a romance, centering on two fighter pilots and the nurse they both love. Naturally, it also comes with the type of relationship melodrama and bombastic action that we expect from Bay. The love triangle at the core may be fictional, but how accurately does the movie portray the event it's named after? Fire up the engines and find out what the fuck really happened to this movie. The script for Pearl Harbor came from writer Randall Wallace, who had previously provided highly suspect historical accuracy with Mel Gibson's Braveheart. The story follows childhood chums Rafe McCauley and Danny Walker, played by Ben Affleck and Josh Hartnett. By January 1941, these two best friends are Army Air Corps pilots serving under Major Jimmy Doolittle, a real military figure and aviation pioneer. As the war rages, before the involvement of the United States, Rafe is offered an opportunity to join the illustrious Eagle Squadron, a branch of the British Royal Air Force, to help fight Germany's advance. But while the Eagle Squadron did exist, Rafe would not have been able to join, since the US wasn't yet officially part of the war, and it was strictly prohibited for any active airmen to engage in fighting overseas. However, it was legal for non-military American citizens to join their British counterparts in the skies. Thanks for watching Joe Blow videos. If you enjoy our shows, please like and subscribe, and click the bell to be notified when new videos go live. Now, back to the show. At his physical fitness exam before shipping out, Rafe meets nurse Evelyn Johnson, played by Kate Beckinsale, and they quickly form a romantic connection. Soon after, Rafe joins his fellow British airmen in England. It's not explicitly stated in the movie what battles Rafe was part of, but the Eagle Squadron was primarily organized to help Allied forces defend the United Kingdom during the Battle of Britain, considered one of the first major military campaigns fought entirely by air forces. The German Air Force, known as the Luftwaffe, engaged in a widespread aerial assault against Britain, hoping to knock the country out of the war and destabilize the Allied movement. After months of fighting, Germany suffered a major defeat that marked a significant turning point in the war. Exactly how long this battle lasted is contested. The British say it went from July to October 1940, but German historians argue it lasted much longer, with the London bombing raids known as the Blitz going until June 1941. Still, with daylight dogfights gradually ending around September 1940, it's highly unlikely the movie's aerial battle over the English Channel would have occurred in 1941. While Rafe is fighting overseas, where he's believed to be lost in action, Evelyn and Danny visit Pearl Harbor a few months before the attack. A number of different characters are introduced, including Dory Miller, who was in fact a real cook stationed on the USS West Virginia, and was the boxing champion of his ship. At this point, Japan is in the early planning stages, with Admiral Yamamoto overseeing the secret mission, incited by the US cutting off oil exports to Japan. While this is mostly true, other important factors in the US sanctions included Japan's invasion of China and the Nanking Massacre, as well as Japan's apparent appetite for expansion. Negotiations for a peaceful solution consistently failed, and war between Japan and the United States started to seem inevitable. Since Japan did not have the necessary firepower to stand against the US and the Allied forces, their only chance to get the upper hand was through a sneak attack. With Yamamoto's plans officially approved by Japanese leadership, the film showcases the diligent training and weapons alterations required to pull off the attack. This includes adjustments to torpedoes so they could navigate shallow Hawaiian waters. The film proposes that a number of US intelligence officials were warned of a potential attack on Pearl Harbor. This is mostly fictional because no one actually thought Pearl Harbor could be a legitimate target. The exception was Admiral Kimmel, the commander-in-chief of the US Pacific Fleet at the time. Similar to his portrayal in the film, the real Kimmel was a vocal critic of moving the fleet to Hawaii because of how vulnerable it could be to just such an attack. In reality, the US had gathered sufficient intelligence to indicate an impending attack, but they did not know when or where. 
With Japan's radio silent navy moving deeper into ocean waters, it was assumed that they were targeting the American-controlled Philippine Islands, home to important raw materials like rubber. And then, in the early hours of December 7th, Japan attacked. In the film, a radar technician notices a large signal coming in from the north, but his superior orders him to ignore the reading, assured it's just a group of B-17 bombers flying in from the mainland. That error in judgment actually happened. In the ensuing battle sequence, Michael Bay effectively captures the palpable shock and horror. But it isn't entirely an accurate depiction. Amid the destruction, numerous ships are decimated by torpedoes and bombs. Historians have criticized the film for including ships that were simply not at Pearl Harbor at the time, including Spruance-class destroyers that didn't enter service until the 1970s. Soon after, a Japanese pilot specifically targets the USS Arizona, one of four major battleships stationed at Pearl Harbor. The bomb punctures the deck and catastrophically detonates in a munitions room. In real life, the explosion was indeed reportedly so massive that it lifted the battleship out of the water. Nearly 1,200 crewmen perished, more than twice that of any other ship in port. Of the 21 ships damaged in the attack, the USS Arizona was one of the few that could not be salvaged and reinstated. On the nearby USS West Virginia, Cook Dory Miller helps several wounded sailors to safety and shoots down a Japanese plane using an anti-aircraft gun. This is actually abbreviated from reality, as Dory, who was never trained to operate such a weapon, downed six Japanese aircraft before his ship sank. Miller was awarded the Purple Heart and Navy Cross for his actions, and was declared one of the first U.S. heroes of World War II. Dory Miller survived Pearl Harbor, but was later killed in action in 1943. Bay's depiction of the pandemonium in the hospital is also reasonably accurate. Inundated with wounded sailors and dead bodies, Evelyn and the nurses use lipstick to mark those who have received morphine, as there were just too many people to keep track of. And donated blood is kept in Coca-Cola bottles. According to a Navy nurse who was stationed at Pearl Harbor, these details seem authentic given the overwhelming situation. However, the naval hospital getting bombed and nurses gunned down as they run for cover were fabrications by the Master of Mayhem. Although the real hospital suffered some indirect damage, the Japanese never deliberately targeted the building or its staff. As the first wave draws to a close, Rafe and Danny and a number of other pilots head to a smaller nearby airfield. Under a barrage of incoming fire, the two manage to get planes off the ground and engage the second wave of Japanese attackers. While Danny and Rafe are fictional characters, their actions were inspired by real pilots George Welch and Kenneth Taylor, who took to the skies in P-40 Warhawks and eliminated at least six Japanese aircraft. They also did not take off while under attack and were joined by other U.S. airmen during the battle. Critics took some issue with the use of fictional characters claiming the heroic actions of actual figures. Kenneth Taylor, who died in 2006 at the age of 96, was never consulted for the film and considered it, quote, a piece of trash. As the attack draws to its conclusion, Admiral Yamamoto is told that only 29 of 350 planes were shot down, which is actually true. Only 129 Japanese soldiers were killed, compared to the nearly 2,400 Americans who perished in the attack. Yamamoto decides to call off the third wave of Japanese planes, claiming they already lost the element of surprise. While this did play a role in the real admiral's decision, he was also concerned about American anti-aircraft performance and a lack of sufficient fuel for the ships, which could necessitate abandoning empty destroyers if they remained in range. With the main objective of the mission satisfied, the Japanese called it quits while they were ahead. <laughs> Following the attack, President Franklin D. Roosevelt delivers his famous Day of Infamy speech in Washington, D.C. The real Roosevelt required a wheelchair after being paralyzed from the waist down from a battle with polio. He often tried to hide this from the American public using a number of techniques, including metal leg braces to prop him up at the podium, which the movie accurately portrays. According to a number of historians, that might be the only accurate aspect of the movie's FDR. In a cabinet meeting following the attacks, Roosevelt and his advisors attempt to work out the best next plan of action. FDR suggests taking the fight to Japan, but his cabinet rejects the motion. The president then miraculously forces himself out of his wheelchair for a grand speech, essentially stating that anything is possible if you try. Of course, this never happened. By this point in his life, Roosevelt had lost the ability to stand. 
And this type of showy display is a direct contradiction to the real FDR's more subdued personality. And to top it all off, his entire cabinet readily agreed with his calls to strike Japan. After the official declaration of war, a top secret mission known as the Doolittle Raid was set in motion seeking to bomb major Japanese industrial centers, including Tokyo, for the purpose of hindering the enemy while also raising morale at home. In the film, Rafe and Danny are recruited for this mission, even though in reality, fighter pilots would not have been selected to fly B-25 bombers. The pilots immediately begin training to take off from a carrier ship. Fuel tanks are added to the planes to cover the long flight, and unnecessary equipment is stripped for weight and efficiency. For the most part, this sequence in the film is pretty accurate. The modified B-25s were loaded onto the USS Hornet and shipped out in early April 1942, and their flight would effectively be a one-way ticket. The plan was to launch the planes 400 miles off the coast of Japan, bomb the targets, and then head directly to China and hope to be rescued by their Chinese allies. But the USS Hornet is spotted, forcing the planes to take off 624 miles away from the coast rather than the planned 400. In truth, the pilots had to start from 650 miles off the coast, even more dangerous than shown in the film. In an effort to make the planes even lighter, Doolittle ordered all tail guns removed and replaced with black painted broom handles, which seems ridiculous, but actually happened. The real Doolittle even claimed the broomsticks were surprisingly effective at deterring Japanese fighters. In the film, the bombers seem to specifically target an industrial center in Tokyo, with entire warehouses and buildings blown to smithereens in standard Michael Bay fashion. While the real Doolittle raid did target Tokyo, it was broken up into five waves, with each group targeting different locations, including Osaka and the Yokosuka Navy Yard. The raid dealt a psychological blow to Japan, who never anticipated an American attack on their own soil. The raid concludes with a number of B-25s crash landing in Japanese-occupied China. Rafe and Danny and their crews are quickly surrounded by enemy soldiers and a firefight ensues, resulting in Danny's death. Everything in this sequence was entirely fabricated. There was no firefight on Chinese ground, and all but 11 crewmen were able to reach safety relatively quickly. The movie concludes with the participants of the raid receiving Distinguished Flying Cross medals, which did happen. Played over these final scenes is a voiceover from Evelyn. Before the Doolittle Raid, America knew nothing but defeat. After it, there was hope of victory. This implies that the raid was a major turning point in the American war effort. But while the attack did boost American morale and deliver a blow to Japan's, in reality it was far from significant. In fact, the real Doolittle himself considered it a failure, since they lost all their aircraft and only dealt minor damage to the intended targets. Perhaps unsurprisingly, for a director who would go on to make five movies about giant sentient alien robots, Michael Bay obviously never intended to adhere strictly to the facts surrounding the real Pearl Harbor attack, and instead aimed to make a patriotic movie that leaned heavily on emotion and spectacle. While making the film, Bay did interview a number of survivors and researched the attack to inform the story. And the film does contain a number of accurate details about the events. But as producer Jerry Bruckheimer himself stated, Pearl Harbor is certainly not meant to be a history lesson. Let us know your thoughts. Leave a comment in the comments. And thanks for watching.